Okay, please welcome Kieran Taylor. Hello, everyone. So, uh, like we heard, my name is Kieran Taylor. I am a data platform engineer at Instacart. And the title of this talk today is an homage to a fairly famous blog post called Data, sorry, Engineers Should Not Write ETLs. Um, and the argument in that post is that the sometimes onerous, oftentimes hot potato task of writing and managing ETL should not be thrown over the fence from a data science team to a data engineering team. And my argument today is that we should not be throwing any of our data governance related tasks over any fences to any teams either. And it just so happens that I am on one of the teams that often gets it thrown over the fence to, but that's a coincidence. Um, so the thing which I want you to be able to leave today with is a really strong mental model about how we build a scalable approach to data governance. And when I, say data, when I say scalable, what I mean is that once our data sets grow larger, then any single person or any single team uh, can be intimately familiar with them. It, it, everything still works and doesn't fall apart. So let's look at uh, how we're going to get there. First, we're going to talk through how we got here, why I'm on stage today. Uh, then we will be answering what I think of as the fundamental question when we are building any system for data governance, which is, should this consumer be able to access this data? I'm going to go over and over in that one today. Finally, I will present you with our solution, um, and that is going to be leaving what I'm going to coin get a manager's approval flow. This will all become obvious in the next few slides. Um, but first of all, how do we get here? So our mission at Instacart is to give people access to the food that they love. And one of the side effects in doing that is that we have accumulated a lot of data. And I mean a lot of data. It gets very complex very quickly. Just to give you a picture into some of that complexity, we have over a quarter of a million tables and views within a single DB, or a catalog in the Unity world. And we have lots of catalogs, lots of DBs. We also have a lot of custom agreements in place with our retail partners, which means that our access rules both need to change over time and need to be fairly fine-grained in terms of who can access data, under what circumstances, and when. We also have data living in multiple platforms, multiple warehouses, um, and we will talk about what that, the implications for that are soon as well. But just to give you a real picture and a story about uh, some of this complexity, I don't know if anybody immediately recognizes this picture, but it is uh, it's from the movie, I can't remember which Jason Bourne film, but one of the Jason Bourne films. And if anyone's not familiar, Jason Bourne is a spy, he has amnesia, and he doesn't realize that he's a spy. And he comes across one day uh, a security deposit box. And inside this box, he finds a bunch of passports, which are for himself. He has a Russian passport, UK passport, American passport. And he slowly realizes and puts together that he's a spy. And I was reminded of this scene when I was having a conversation with a developer very early on when I first joined Instacart, and we were onboarding with Databricks. And they asked me a very simple question, which is, how do we pull data from a different cloud data platform process it in Databricks, and then write it into S3 in a different account than where our Spark cluster lives. And it should be a very simple task. And I said to them, it is very simple. All you have to do is you have to go to the competing cloud data platform, uh, create a username and a password, create a role there, create grants to that role for the access to the data, create a warehouse, go back over to Databricks, and create a secret scope. You then create a secret in the secret scope and a grant in the secret scope to allow you to read from it. You then have your instance profile. You have an IAM role in the other account. You have the assume role permissions between the two. And you start to realize that it gets fairly complex very quickly. And as I saw the blood start to drain from this developer's face, I said to them, isn't it so cool? You have so many identities in order to do your job. You are just like Jason Bourne. Um, they didn't seem to agree with me. But the point I'm trying to make here is that when we think about uh, data access and data governance, the question which is really fundamental at the business level is can this consumer read from this data source? We don't care about the source system primitives we're working with, and if it's confusing for a developer to have to work with each of these primitives and get on board of them, it gets incredibly complex if some of our non-technical folk, like anyone working in compliance, governance, legal, also wants to explore that. So I've been through sessions with our internal audit team. We we're trying to start describing this. and I start whiteboarding each of those components out I just spoke about, and uh, yeah. They don't like me very much. So um, like I said, this fundamental question that we need to answer is, should this consumer 
be able to access this data. Any of the systems that we build are gonna be built on top of this question. So, I think a lot of you today have probably been through a coding interview before where the thing which they suggest you to do is build, build the most dumb solution possible first, build a naive solution. And we're gonna do that today, and the system we're gonna build at first is that we're gonna hire an engineer, and we're gonna put them in the Spark query plan, and then whenever a query gets executed, this engineer gets a message on Slack, and they get asked, should this query go through, do we wanna uh, approve or deny that? And when we think about what this engineer is doing in their job, they have a few pieces of information which they need to be able to approve or deny that query. And what are those pieces of information? The first thing is what are the business meaningful attributes of the data? So what does the data actually contain? Does it have PII? Is it accounting data? The second thing is what are the business meaningful attributes of the user or the use case which they're working in? The third thing is what are the business rules around that access? Once we have each of these bits of information, we can have that one engineer happily go in and approve and deny those requests. And whilst our team is small and our data sets are small as well, we may have a single person who's able to actually answer this off the top of their head. Once we start to scale up and we get close to a quarter of a million tables in one DB, then we have to involve multiple teams in each of these questions. And so when we think about who are the people who we need to involve in this scheme, this harebrained scheme I'm coming up with, to actually answer these questions. The first one is what are the attributes about the data itself? And this is usually gonna be the data owner. So if we think about something like in the data mesh architecture, we want people to be owners over their products, owner, sorry, owners over their data products. They are gonna be the most intimately familiar with what that table actually contains. The second thing is what are the business meaningful attributes of the user or the use case? So a lot of the time, we should have uh, an HR system in place which gives you information about what department does this person work in, what locale are they working in, what is their rank, et cetera. And then we also might have direct managers who are able to give more context about the individual project which they're working on. So what is the use case right now? They can give that business justification. The final thing is what are the business rules around the access? Um, and a lot of that time, it's gonna be those governance, compliance, and legal folk who can tell us from a regulatory point of view, what are we allowed to do with our data? From a contractual basis with our retail partners, what can we do with the data? And then there also may be some input from the data owners themselves. So is this something which we productionize yet while well, the SLA's around it? Do we want other people to be consuming from that table yet? So obviously, uh, when we think about solution, we have this one guy who's answering all of the questions on the query plan itself. Uh, our time complexity is pretty good. We're at constant time factor. We have a constant number of people we have to talk to, but unfortunately, the constant factor is very high. We're probably gonna take a couple days to a week to be able to answer any of these queries and get those queries running. So we need to think about how can we do better. And before we do that, the whole reason I'm going through this kind of thought experiment is because this is not that different than what a lot of companies do today when they get an access request, especially when the access request is for sensitive data. And this is what I'm coining get a manager's approval flow. So what does that typically look like? We have someone who comes to some channel manned by a, uh, an on-call engineer somewhere, and they say, give me access to this data. And a couple of thoughts go through that on-call's head, which is, should I do this? Who are you? What is the data you're giving access to? And they don't have the information there available to them to answer that. So instead of that, they say, open a ticket and get your manager's approval. Now the manager, the first thing you look is, who is this person who wants access? And they are very familiar with them, they're one of their friends, so they say, sure, let's do this. And we have a good history of all the access requests which have been made, but obviously the problem we can see here is that the person who is actually actioning those requests, so is maintaining our data governance strategy, does not have the information required to actually uh, to make the right decision. So we could start bringing in all of those other people uh, who we mentioned in the last slide. And this picture would look more like this. So when we ask what is the data that we're giving access to, we have our data product teams who can answer that. Uh, when we're saying, should I do it? We have both from a business level and the data owners themselves who can help us answer that. And then when we're saying, who are you? The manager can give some context and our HR team can give context there as well. But there is a reason why that doesn't happen today. And like I said, it's because it takes a really long time to speak to each of these people individually. Um, people are time strapped and so eventually we revert back to this get a manager's approval flow as I've been coining it. So as we think about building out a system for this, I'm just gonna jump straight to it and show you the solution which we have and talk about how we actually arrived there, uh, how we arrived at that design. 
So each of the things which I'll talk about with our solution is just a logical extension of that question itself. So should this consumer be able to access this data? It's just broken down and embedded into the, into the system which we built out. So this is a super high level view of what it looks like, and we'll spend a while on this slide actually, actually talking through this. So on the left hand side here, we have each of the concepts that we care about. I'm not sure if you guys can see this. We have each of the concepts we can care about uh, when it comes to that actual question. So at the top, the business rules relate to what are the business rules around access. In the middle, we have our schemas and tables, which represents what is actually in this data which we're giving access to. And at the bottom, we have representations of each of our users. So who's the consumer trying to access this? In the middle layer here, where we have YAML, UI, Terraform, Okta, this is what I'm calling the configuration layer. So once we have those abstract concepts that we care about at a business level, at a business level we have to have some way of actually encoding this into the system that we're gonna build. And I'll talk through exactly how we do that, but that's our configuration layer. On the second to last layer on the right, we have the execution engines themselves. So these are the things which are actually taking that configuration, applying it to the data platforms we work with, and actually making sure that the access is in place that we expect it to be. So up the top, we have our, our schema lockdown tool. Now what this does is it monitors our write access. And we split these two systems between write and read access controls. And there's a reason that we did this. The first one is that for the write case, most of the times it's very simple. It's a one-to-one -one relationship, especially in a production system. We want a single user writing into a single table. And so it's very easy to write a YAML config, which essentially says, for this table or for any of the schemas in this table, it should be this one user who is able to write into it. And what this schema lockdown tool does is it passes that YAML config, goes into the source system, shows all the grants against the given table, and if anyone is in there who is unexpected and shouldn't have right access, we alert on that to the correct team. And obviously, there's situations where we actually do want it to happen, where someone who is outside of the YAML config has access. Usually, if we are responding to an instant, running backfills, or um, anything operational there. The second component that we have here is the solution which we built with our partners at Immuta. And so this is for our read access controls. And just to talk through what each of the, the sub boxes here look like. We have our subscription and data policies, which is actually converting those business rules that we care about with access into an actionable, uh, an actionable policy, which actually goes in and, um, and uh, brokers that access itself. And I'll show you on the next slide exactly what those policies look like. Uh, the data sources are just a representation of the schemas and the tables, coupled together with the attributes that we care about. And then the users, again, are just a representation of our users, coupled together with the attributes and groupings that we care about there. So the one thing that is missing from this diagram right now is the actual tagging strategy itself. So once we've ingested those schemas and tables into a muter, how do we add the tags and the attributes that we care about? And this is something where our main approach is to couple those tags with the table DDLs themselves. So wherever someone is defining what the shape of that table should look like, they should also be supplying the tags that we care about gating access on. So for example, we may have an RDS table which is synchronized into Unity, and then we add some tags there which uh, represent both what it looks like in RDS and what it looks like in Unity, and that is written where that table is defined. So in our case, there are some Ruby migration files which do that, and we can add those annotations alongside in those Ruby migration files. The benefit of doing this is that a lot of these processes are hooking in to our, oral, uh, our existing uh, PR processes itself. So when someone wants to make change to a table, when someone wants to add a new table, we can make sure that the correct tags are in place, uh, are in place there as well. So that's how we get that configuration to do with our data. The other config steps I'll talk about now is just I already said the YAML config up top for the business rules. The piece which we are using the Immuta UI for right now is to actually configure the subscription and data policies. So you'll see on the next slide what those subscription policies look like and why it may not be simple to just add them uh, as a simple YAML config. Um, and well, there are also some guardrails that we, get with, sorry, that we get with the UI when people are using it in order to help them actually craft these policies themselves. The, the third component here is we built our own in-house Terraform provider, which we're actually looking to open source as well, which helps us basically, uh, um, instead of just directly querying the API for a muter, to add these data sources and users we care about, to be able to encode that um, as code as well. And that obviously helps us, again, hook into our existing PR processes. 
The final thing is our SSO system, Okta, uh, which actually, via a skim integration, just passes the users into a muter. That one's pretty simple. At the end of the day, the final component here is Unity. And what happens is that a muter goes in, takes those rules that we care about, and actually converts them into the source system primitives that we need to gate access within Unity itself. So at the end of the day, the end user is going to be going into uh, Databricks environment, interacting with tables in the same way that they would have previously, um, and they are unaware that Immuter is the thing which is gating access here. So the next thing I will show you is what some of these policies look like. And we have two types of read access policies in Immuter that we care about. The first one is a subscription policy. What a subscription policy does is it gives you access to a table. So, uh, sorry, let me, just, let me talk to you both of them first. So subscription policies gives you access to a table. A data policy then restricts within that table what data can you access. So if we look through the example of the first one, any of our data sources, and this is actually very close to what we have uh, live right now, uh, just slightly redacted. But if any of our data sources are tagged as low sensitivity, we can give default access to anyone who is in the Instacart organization. So for example, if we have a contractor working with us, they won't have default access. For any of our developers, they will get that access by default. For the data policies, we're saying that if anything, if a column has been tagged as uh, sensitive PI, then we're gonna hash that value for anyone who isn't part of the group PI users. And like I said, each of these is just converted into source system primitives so that the end result is transparent to the user actually interacting with these tables. And uh, with the data policies here, this one's working at a column level. We can also do this at a row level to start segmenting the data and only show rows which are appropriate for that, for that end user. So as we look through uh, this solution that we built with Immuter, we can just look at what are the responsibilities that each of us have for actually uh, con contributing to the system. So for our side, like I said, we need to supply the tags for the data, we need to supply the tags for the users, and we actually go in and write those policies. Immuter then owns translating each of those policies to the source system primitives that actually gate that access. One of the big things that they do is actually reporting on the current state as well. So like I said in that earlier example, where I'm bringing out the 50,000 different passports that you need to be able to show what access someone has, instead of that, we have a single pane of glass now where we can ask a question such as, who are all of the users who can access our accounting data? And then Immuter is able to create a report based on that, uh, based on that current state. The final thing it does is it gives context or purpose to the current access. So what I mean by this is we have, um, we have this concept of purposes and projects within Immuter. And what that means is that if we have a single user who is working across different projects, so on one project they're working for retailer A, on another project they're working for retailer B, and within each of those projects they should see a different subset of the data within a table, we can actually supply that context from Immuter so that we make sure that uh, that the, sup the superset of that user's permissions can be broken down based on the given project they're working on. So if we think about uh, this solution that we built and where we've got to from that earlier get a manager's approval flow, you may be asking, like, why are some of these things required? Why, is, why do we actually need to bring in a muter? Why do we need to build a schema lockdown tool? Um, why can we not just do this ourselves with the primitives that are already available? At the end of the day, these policies get converted into those source system primitives themselves. The first one is that re-implementing those rules on various different systems is really difficult. So the reason I went through that whole Jason Bourne thing earlier is just to show you that the identities that you actually have to deal with in order to, uh, in order to get your superset of access and then tweaking those as those evolve over time gets very complicated. Uh, most people don't have a full view of actually what are all the systems involved in that. Um, so it's very difficult to maintain that across, across different systems. The second one is that it's very difficult to actually set upper bounds on access. So if we're working directly with uh, an AWS IAM policy, we may be able to put a deny statement on, um, on a given role. As we move into something like grants given to users, given to groups, what tends to happen is these grants tend to accumulate. And it's very, it's very easy to say, this one user should have access to this table. It's very difficult to say another user shouldn't have access to the same table. What we can do with the rules that we've created inside both of these systems is we can put that deny behavior in place and actually make sure that anyone who shouldn't have access to a table won't ever get access. The final one, like I said, just to reiterate again this point, is that visibility is really poor. So I've worked a lot with our internal audit teams, our compliance teams, tried to explain this stuff on the whiteboard. It usually doesn't go very well. Um, so yeah, so having that reporting built in, which is converted into those business meaningful terms that people care about, who can access what data is a big benefit. 
that we get from this here. So uh, some of this we're going to go through and just uh, look at. When we were thinking about designing the system itself, the goals which we had, and some of this was repeated again, but the main thing that I want to talk about here is those separation of concerns. It's very, it's very important to abstract out and think, at a business level, what is it that we care about when it comes to access? Those three questions that we keep coming back to. The benefit there is that the cross-team requirements and the cross-team collaboration which is needed to both change access, audit access, is reduced a lot. So we have the tools now for people to go in, non-technical users, and see who can access our data and actually, um, actually produce those reports ourselves. The second thing is that we have this single pane of glass in order to do this. So we're not having to jump between AWS consoles, uh, Databricks console, some Terraform files, in order to be able to see what is the current state of our access. And finally, like I said, vis visibility is baked in, which means that these rules actually get maintained over time, especially as people join and leave the company. It becomes very difficult if you don't have this single pane of glass to actually, uh, actually maintain that over time. So finally, I'm just going to talk through some of the challenges which we had to address when we were building this. So the first one. Like I said, we had a lot of data to work with. We had to really think about what we were going to prioritize when it came to actually uh, onboarding data sources, tagging it, and making sure that we're covering uh, the most critical data sets that we care about. So this was definitely, some of this was driven from a regulatory point of view. If there's certain things that we need to be compliant with by a given date, that is a great forcing function for making sure that those data sources are onboarded into this new system. The second point is just a prioritization and building those concentric circles of uh, what are the most critical sets we care about. A lot of the time when we look at a distribution graph of we have 100,000 tables, only 100 of those are going to be queried on a daily basis by people. So you can start to sort of uh, narrow down that funnel and make sure that you're covering those most critical data sets at first. The second point here is that as we are building the system and as we are migrating sources across, the intermediate state can become uh, confusing. So someone who is only familiar with Databricks isn't familiar with any of the other systems we've built, maybe asking, why can I not use the existing grants that we have available to us in order to actually grant that access? Um, so it takes some uh, communication with your team, takes some socializing of what you're building, making sure that you're shouting about each of the systems uh, that you're building early on. I think that's definitely a critical point in terms of making people aware that we are all moving in one direction when it comes to our, to our access controls. The final thing I have here is that uh, one of the technical problems that we have is that we are moving everything to this per user identity access rule. So like I said, the question which we're trying to answer is should this consumer be able to access this data? And when we're thinking about that consumer, in order to be able to answer that question properly, we really need to have a strong identifier for that user. So we need to know that I'm Kieran, my identifier is kieran.taylorintscart.com. As we start to plug in downstream tools into these systems, such as BI tools, reporting tools, we start to lose that fidelity sometimes. So we may have to actually pull our connection, our users together, um, and then we have uh, a loss of the, like I said, a loss of the fidelity that we can actually make those, uh, uh, where we can make those policies. So the solution for doing this, and the thing which is really critical, and I think we should have spent more time on when we were first building this solution, is to make sure that we have both strong identifiers for users in each of our systems, and also strong identifiers for each of the groups of users in our systems. So what do I mean by that? We want to make sure that if we can identify user A, B, and C as part of a group in one system, we want to make sure that we can identify user A, B, and C as part of a group in another system as well. So if we think about applying this to something like Databricks with a BI tool over the top, as long as we can say that our users in Databricks are co coherent with that group of users in the BI tool as well, then the access rules that we write based on those groups will actually flow downstream to the downstream tool as well. This is something which I think there's some subtle problems which you come across here when you're working with this problem. It's just something to be aware of upfront as we think about building out the system. Uh, I guess I've ended on quite a sour note there, but in all, all, <laughs> all in all, it, it's, gone, it's gone very well in terms of what we've done. And so yeah, I want to uh, thank you all very much and see if there's any questions for, for what we have today. And I'd also like to invite our partners at Immutron stage as well.